That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Oh Man, the International Mail Story, uh, which premiered at the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival. It also played Outfest last year. It is being released in a, a limited theatrical engagement June 5th, 2023, courtesy of Giant Pictures. And it will be available on digital platforms June 6th, a day later. The directors? Uh, Brian Darling and Jesse Finley Reed. Uh, it's Mr. Darling's first uh, documentary feature, and Jesse Finley Reed also uh, directed a documentary about Roy Lichtenstein last year. I was very excited to watch this because I have a connection to international mail. I was a model. No. I used to receive the catalog, and in college in the late 90s, I would visit the store in West Hollywood. So I had very fond memories of it. Um, and I, and I think because of that, I enjoyed this documentary well enough. However, um, I don't know that I thought it was very well constructed. I think that, <laughs> yeah, it's, it feels like it's missing some key components. It's only roughly a little over 80 minutes and I don't get a real good sense of when things stop, started. It has some emotional and poignant moments, but at the same time, I was oblivious to the international mail catalog. At the, at the time it was popping, I guess. So did, a lot of this was quite new to me. Well, here, so it's about, or it is a nostalgic and colorful peek behind the pages and personalities of International Mail, one of the most ubiquitous and sought after mail order catalogs of the 80s and 90s. So yeah, I guess it's interesting because for someone who is very familiar with it, I, I think it's enjoyable enough, but for someone who isn't, and even though I am, I agree. I didn't fully understand where we were in time. The documentary doesn't discuss where international mail is today. Right. It, it just kind of ends. It just kind I, of ends. I had to look up that the last catalog uh, published was actually in 2007. But it starts with sort of the history of men's fashion and how men basically only wore like jeans, like dungarees for work and all the shirts were kind of the same and men just, they were they reference a book which I believe was turned into a movie called The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. With uh, Gregory Peck. Mm -hmm. So this idea of f men's fashion being more flamboyant was out of the picture, or out of the question. But then we meet uh, Gene Burkhardt, who's the founder of International Mail and we find out that he was in the military he was in the air force mm -hmm. he was miserable working there but he was he was offered a job in europe to basically sell stuff to the different army bases and while he was there he discovered fashion specifically he discovered an item called a suspensory mm -hmm. garment which i had no clue what that was but it's basically like a jock strap mm -hmm. where only the scrotum is being held, but the penis is loose. Uh, and I'm sure and they, they, he found it in a medical supply store. So mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a medical purpose for it. But when he returned back to the States, he thought, let me make something like this and sell it. And he made something called the jock sock. So basically like a jock strap, except there were no straps in the back. Mm -hmm. And he started selling them through catalogs because he read a book called How to Make a Million Dollars Doing Mail Order. Mm -hmm. And it was a hit. So we kind of go through the 70s. Well, and... after it was advertised in Playboy. Yeah, because he couldn't get anyone, because the visual of like a, a well, because, you know, they were like cartoons back then. So trying to place an ad in like a mainstream publication with um, like a well-built naked man wearing this thing was not going to fly. So he only advertised in like the gay, advocate like gay rags but then he was able to place an ad in playboy and that's when everything took off so then we get a history of kind of how they built it and the people involved then we find out that gene sold his business in the late 80s to the largest mail order company and then we hear about how they wanted to change it to make it more mainstream we hear about the types of models they use so they wanted men who looked straight to sell these clothes which were clearly very flamboyant there's a reason why gay men love them and then it kind of just ends like 
it ends and it's trying to it's trying to play with um, several ideas that it keeps repeating namely from what I kept hearing was that gay men and straight men are a lot more alike than anybody probably wants to realize both in, because because both groups are devotees of uh, the cult of masculinity so I think I feel like this documentary could have gone so many ways to explore this idea of masculinity and how straight men and gay men have this relationship. They talk about it a lot, but I don't know that there's a full examination. We do get, or I mean, there isn't. We do get some of the models who were featured in the catalog talking. I thought that was fascinating. We could have spent more time with them. We don't talk to any customers about why they loved it. Then we're told that their main base was women like most of their customers like 75 percent of the customers were women buying for their men we don't hear from any women and why they wanted their men wearing the stuff we then we even get a retailer so a customer who they, it, it's not explained but there's a black man who owned something called omar's closet so i assume he was a business owner who ordered from international mail and sold their mm -hmm. items and he is the one who mentions, like, they didn't really have any black models. And then immediately we get a segment where they talk about in the 70s they did have black models, but the, mo the clothes those models were wearing never sold well. And they only had two. So then they stopped, and then, yeah. And then there's some going back and forth about how, because once uh, Jean Burkhardt sold, mostly it's implied due to the AIDS crisis decimating the staff and, you know, everybody, uh, and couldn't handle it anymore. And basically how there tried to be this uh, heter heterosexualization of the catalog when it was show sold to who who's at Harp. Mm. Starts with an H, but yeah. it was the largest male catalog company. And I think a lot of, a large part of the conversation you and I had after watching it was how uh, these things made by the community, the queer community, also fail the community and the black community, and and how I think all of us have this realization that these images we're being sold that we're supposed to worship as ideal standards of beauty uh, are fake and, and not necessarily true, but we're conditioned to believe so. So that's why I would have liked real customers talking about why. I mean, even someone like me, like, why did I like going to that store knowing that it's not for, like, they're not trying to appeal to someone who looks like me. I don't have the body of the people who wear these clothes. It was a fantasy and it felt good. Like, I wish they had more of that. And it does talk about the inferiority complex. I, I think a lot of both gay and straight customers felt uh, seeing these models. And one of the commentators talking about how basically it's the ultimate phallic symbol because it's the hard body it's like that you're, you're constantly in erection <laughs> yeah i thought that was interesting and could have had more of that mm -hmm. um but again we get we do hear quite a bit from previous models some of whom are talking about their insecurities pleasantly uh many of them talked about how because i think only two were gay and only one of them is one of those is speaking yeah and only one is speaking and but they, so all these straight models were talking about how, yes, we were uncomfortable back then, but then we, they, like, some of them talk about how they learned how to accept all types of people, and it was a pleasant work experience, even though they had to wear ridiculous clothes, and they talk about how a lot in the, cat, a lot of the imagery we see in the catalogs were, because it's always like two guys together, how when they're laughing, they're usually laughing at like how stupid they look. <laughs> so I think it was kind of like, a peek behind the curtain that felt it definitely deflated my feelings about my memories of this catalog in the store are a little tarnished after you know gene the founder seemed he's not vile or anything no. but it just seems like he just he didn't care about money they talk about how he didn't know how to run the business very well um so it felt like there wasn't a lot of passion behind. Yeah, it's kind of like he cared. He wanted to have more uh, innovation in men's fashion per se, but didn't really didn't care about who would be wearing them or why or who this is appealing to. And again, going back to the black models, it's like, well, you know, a lot of that has to do with familiarity, and this large catalog with a lot of different men in it. It's surely you could have a few, and who cares that those garments aren't selling like gangbusters? It's also introducing something to the public. It's that if you build it, they will come mentality. Well, speaking to that, 
we're told that later on, after it was purchased, like in the late 90s and early 2000s, they did start putting black models, yeah, like people of color, and those items sold well. You see Shamar more. And it's interesting talking about, you know, flamboyant clothes, i.e. having color in them. Uh, a lot of other communities that weren't white liked those things. Well, they say that, that non-white customers liked the colorful yeah, clothes. Yeah, which I think so. is funny. But, uh, but so, so part of why I don't think this is super well constructed is because we hear from a woman named Gloria who we're told, we get a lot of her backstory, single mother, two children, struggling, and she applies for a job as a secretary at International Mail in the 70s. And she goes for an interview. Jean asks her if you can type. She says yes. And it turns out she can't. She was just desperate, desperate, desperate. And then we all, she, they never say what her role was or they talk about what she ended up doing there. We just see like whenever she's being interviewed that she was like VP of marketing or something. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I don't really understand how important she was, but she's t talking a lot about her experience there. And then when the company is sold, Gene says he decided to sell it because half his staff was decimated by AIDS and he just couldn't deal with it. And then other staff members are saying, when Gene and Gloria left, we knew that it was over. So that made me think, did, did Gloria get part of the $25 million he sold it for? Why did she leave? Yeah, it's not clear. No. She does say that she was devastated uh, when she learned that Gene sold the company. I, get, I got the sense that she wasn't taken care of as she probably should have been. Uh, or, yeah, I got that sense too, but the documentary is not giving us anything. Right. Also, so I think probably the most affecting part of the documentary is hearing how the AIDS crisis affected this team. Mm -hmm. So that was very emotional. And then it ends with one of the employees who, who was like the head of retail for like, I think the San Diego store. He talks about how he used to keep a, like a black book of all his customers. And he had like 307 entries. And as the, you know, AIDS crisis was in full swing, he would, you know, because he would call his customers regu regularly and find out that they had died. So ultimately he had to throw the book away because most of his customers were gone. That kernel itself is a great idea for a feature film. But that, like, that took me out. And I, so, again, there's so many, like, really interesting, poignant parts of this documentary, but it feels like they just threw in a lot of stuff. It's not very well organized. It feels too short. It does feel too short. Because we're missing the end of the story. You know, it's like by the time we get to the late 90s, 2000s, and these uh, businesses realizing that there are these untapped markets and how that kind of changed things quite a bit, you know. There is a... There is a guy on there who says he was the creative director. I found him so annoying. He's repulsive. He's talking about how he wanted to only hire straight photographers and handlers so they wouldn't make the models uncomfortable. And so that after we were done shooting for the day, they could go watch a sports game or go fishing together. You know, when we're all work, we don't have to be friends with our coworkers. We don't have to do extracurricular activities. I, I, I mean, I think to have this, like to include that in this documentary, we needed more explanation of like, what the situation was like for the models. Did they feel harassed? Did they feel... Because the models talking are just kind of like, yeah, we just felt stupid wearing these stupid clothes, but it was a great gig. One of them in particular, I think his name is Brian Buzzini, apparently was like very popular. Mm -hmm. um, and then at a point, it became so that if you were an international male model, you were like the peak of like physical perfection. So then it became like you would want that job. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't feel slick in its presentation and what that meant for people. Also, there is a guy, I believe his name is Don Wilson, who says he was a CEO of International Mail, but it was unclear to me when. <laughs> and then <laughs> right. he also says that he was going to buy it but then he didn't and that was very vague that was very yeah somebody else bought it for three times the price and then uh, I, yeah. I was so confused so uh, ultimately i left feeling like oh and then we realized that um so gene he died in 2020 mm -hmm. and they have footage of him talking i don't think the footage is very compelling but i imagine the filmmaker felt like they had to use a lot of it because they had it and he's now dead mm -hmm. but i I don't think it really gave us anything. It didn't. I really he don't. He actually seems kind of bored talking. Yeah, I don't get much of a sense about him at all, either in the uh, archival footage or the, the interview footage before he died. Uh, and I think they're trying to supply a lot more pomp and circumstance with the commentators like Carson Kressley and Jake Shears. Uh, and then Matt Bomer is providing narration. narration. 
we do learn that one of their popular garments was a, a pirate shirt that's featured in like an episode of Seinfeld. Yeah, I remember that Seinfeld because I had a pirate shirt. And then, you know, international males reference in Zoolander. But anyway, that pirate shirt, an example of it is featured uh, at the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. like the fashion part of it. But yeah, that's all I have. What would you give this documentary? Uh, two and a half. I would give it two and a half out of five. I thought it was okay. If you know International Mail, I feel like you'd really want to watch it. Uh, it feels a little bit like nostalgia porn. Like it's not digging deep enough for my taste. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>